Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good day, everyone, depending on where you are uh, participating in this Skype Connect dialogue from. Um, as always, my name remains Rafael Kuchi, and uh, today my guest is no other person than Mr. Shamshu Anjurin, uh, who is no new, no new person to African aviation. I'm sure many of you uh, know him very well. Um, he used to be a director at Boeing Commercial Airplanes and that now the coordinator of the Africa Aviation Industry Group. And this body uh, is a collection of organizations and service providers on the African continent that serves the African aviation industry. So the, these entities include the likes of the African Civil Aviation Commission, the African Airlines Association, the uh, Airline Association of Southern Africa, the Council, and uh, organizations like Boeing, Airbus, Embraer, and uh, so many others. And uh, these organizations are uh, the, the person who birthed the idea of bringing these entities together to support the efforts of the African aviation industry is no other than our veteran aviation expert, Mr. Samshu Anjurin, who is guest today. So among other things today, our discussions will, will, will touch on the role and work of AAIG, Africa Aviation Industry Group. And we would also delve into other topical issues in the aviation industry uh, that might be of interest to all of us. And then we, we see what are the ways in which we can move African aviation industry uh, to the next level. So um, without uh, much ado, I would want to, uh, first of all, give my guest the opportunity, Mr. Shamshu, to tell us briefly about yourself and uh, what you do now before we get into the real substance of our discussion today. Shamshu, you have the floor. Thank you, Rafael. It's a very great honor for me to be your, your guest today. I've, I've been following the Sky Connect dialogues and um, it's a very high uh, caliber uh, venue and it's a privilege for me to be your guest today, as I said earlier. So my name is uh, Shamsu Anjorin. Uh, briefly, after my graduation from engineering school, I, I went into the airline industry where I spent 24 years in various capacities from maintenance to operation to uh, strategic management. And I uh, ended up uh, at, the, at, at the CEO's office coordinating the uh, transformation of the airline. We went through liquidation and we were trying to, to build another new airline which never came to fruition. At that point, uh, Boeing recruited me uh, first as analyst uh, in uh, the Accra office, Boeing International Accra office. Then I moved to be the executive director for Western Central Africa in that same office. Moved later to Dubai as the director for safety for Africa and Middle East. And lately to Nairobi to, as a director of government affairs and market development for Sub-Sahara Africa. I retired from Boeing uh, end of 2020, and I kept you, uh, the privilege of coordinating this AIG, uh, which is the African Aviation Industry Group. Wow, what a role of honor. Thank you so much for that brief. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you see, there's no doubt that he is a veteran of African aviation with over 44 years of um, experience in the industry under his belt and still counting. And uh, like uh, Mr. Shamchu said, 
He is retired, but he is not tired. <laughs> so he still has a lot to offer African aviation. And being the head of AIG, he is driving a lot of initiatives and partnering with other stakeholders to improve the lot of African aviation. But before we actually get to discuss about AIG, let me just start with um, the African aviation industry landscape has seen a lot of evolution over the years. And uh, in particular, um, in recent years, we have seen uh, so much dynamism since uh, COVID set on the stage. And uh, I'm not too sure whether uh, African aviation industry is part of the march forward towards recovery or it is stagnant or indeed actually retrogressed. So can, can you help me just, just try and see where is African aviation to be? I think it's one thing is remarkable is the resilience of and one could have thought that the aviation the system would have collapsed uh, through uh, due to the pandemic, but actually the the system didn't. It's it's not in a good shape, but it didn't collapse, and it's uh, it has uh, according to the last uh, report that I read from Afra on the international route, about eighty one percent recovery has uh, taken place compared to 2019, which is remarkable. But uh, I believe that uh, the government should not overestimate the resilience of the industry and they should uh, really take all measures to ease the burden for, for the aviation system. In fact, to, to talking about ease of bedding, we have seen, um, I, I don't remember the most recent statistics, but at some point, globally, airlines had received something like 256 billion in direct financial support to the industry since COVID struck. Uh, in Africa, even though some 25 billion was pledged, to date, I think it's about 2 billion that has actually been deployed to a few airlines. Are we in the same market and are we going to wake up and compete with the others around the world in the future? That is the, that is the challenge for our African aviation system is that it is left alone. It cannot uh, really count on, 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 the, on the governments as in other regions. So it's created a kind of imbalance, but uh, instead of uh, just waiting for, for the governments to support, I think African aviation has done very well in restructuring themselves. We have seen a lot of uh, initiatives uh, transforming uh, passenger airplanes to cargo, developing cargo business. And by the way, cargo has grown up uh, considerably in, in the region. Uh, mirroring what is happening on the global stage. And uh, I think uh, the, the initiatives has been taken to, to keep the industry alive. But as I said earlier, it is still not in a good shape. So we should not overestimate the resilience of the system. A lot has been done, but it's still not in a good shape. And for yes. a very long time, the African aviation industry has never been in a good shape. We are known to have been um, loss making for the longest while, and uh, we're known to have a lot of inefficiencies, low technology adoption, and we're also an industry that is burdened by excessive cost. Now, uh, where should the industry be looking at now if they want to get out of this quack man? It is an opportunity also for the industry to uh, rethink uh, the way it does, it does business. And I think that has been going on. If some initiatives have been taken by airlines, by airports, and uh, it's one of the AIG uh, concerns that uh, we bring, to, we make sure that we have this uh, dialogue, constructive dialogue going on 
between different sectors of the industry to uh, prepare for the to restart and the recovery. Recently, in, uh, we had in November at the annual aeronautical forum, as uh, you remember, that we had a, a forum on uh, risk-based restart and recovery. And then, uh, so, so this is this is going on. But, but, but um, tell me, um, so the industry um, is trying to recover and uh, we have a lot of challenges that are springing up from time to time, also impeding efforts to recovery um, by way of government's um, policies and decisions regarding COVID and health protocols. Initially, when COVID started, there was some collaboration among industry stakeholders led by ICAO, in some cases from the industry side by IATA, by AFRA, and um, at the global stage by the World Health Organization, the Africa CDC. Increasingly, uh, probably it is my way of looking at it, but I think that increasingly we are seeing less and less leadership in these fronts, but rather we are beginning to see um, individual states coming up with unilateral measures that are sort of disrupting further the recovery that we're trying to achieve. Why is that and what can be done? I, I think uh, one of the reasons is the lack of understanding of the, the, the pandemic uh, that we are facing. When some measures are taken, uh, suddenly, like we saw recently with the Omicron variant, uh, it's it, it shaken all the belief that uh, people had. And so the government uh, started taking erratic uh, decision and, and forgot all the good initiatives that they agreed upon earlier. Uh, and it, it was uh, very fortunate that uh, AFRA and AFRA SG uh, made a clarion call to, 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 to cool down a little bit and, and, and look at and, and uh, have a, a, a risk-based approach to address this. So I think from time to time, uh, when there is a, a, a new variant, you will see similar reaction until we understand really what is happening with uh, the way this, this pandemic is, is uh, developing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's nearly two years um, since this pandemic and um, we are still, we still not found our way around it yet. The worry seems to be the way we are getting even more panicky. Yes. The, with the emergence of each uh, uh, strain of the virus. It, it is what is actually worrying for the industry, especially aviation. So what should airlines be doing? How should they uh, um, continue with their business, not knowing what will happen tomorrow? Yeah, there are very fronts of uh, action, as I see it. The first is to keep the dialogue with the health authorities to and governments to make sure that there is a coordinated response to the emerging risk, uh, emerging uh, pandemic risk. If, if any variant come, uh, we shouldn't change the risk-based approach and the coordination among countries to have a, 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 an, ad, an adapted response to, the, to this risk. That's one thing. Second is uh, to continue preparing the industry for, uh, for the restart and, and uh, allowing the people to move, observing the health protocol and making sure that the, the confident travel initiatives are well in place. 
Hmm. So, so now let me let me shift a little bit, and um, but, but before I ask my next question, let me let me just remind our participants that you can participate in this discussion by posting your questions on the Q and A tab. I can see that a few have already started trickling in. Um, please just post your questions there, and we'll deal with them at the appropriate time. Um, in the meantime. Uh, if you have any technical issues, please post them on the chat box and uh, the technical team behind the scenes will be able to assist you uh, with, with, with response, with clarity. Uh, so now I wanted to shift a little bit to uh, the, the area of African aviation safety. We have seen uh, significant improvements in the last couple of years and with and safety involves a lot of money let me put it that way you must you must spend a lot of money to uh, improve your safety levels and and keep at that level now with the low levels of revenues in the industry low levels of revenues to governments um, do you think uh, africa's Aviation safety is at a risk. On the on the safety front, I, I mean, we have to recognize the progress, as you said, made by African aviation over the years. And uh, to give you an example, uh, ICAO has uh, set a global uh, aspiration of zero fatalities by 2030. And uh, despite, uh, apart from few incidents uh, that we regret, few accidents that we regret, Africa has been doing well in 2020, zero fatality, for instance. Uh, and so we, we, we are getting there. The, this success uh, where you can you have seen over the years the accident rate reducing in Africa, although it is still above the world average. But when we, we look at those parameters, we have to be uh, careful reading the numbers because it's easy to have a, a high rate when you divide by, so, by a, a number, a so, so low number of departures. Currently, safety is measured by accident rate, which is number of accident by a million departure. In Africa, total Africa has less than one million departure. So one accident is already two, above two. So uh, until we have uh, big numbers of departure, we should be careful reading how we read the, the, the numbers. That said, we have no other indicator to measure our progress. So we do with that. And, and even in that respect, I think Africa has been doing very well. The, the risk, uh, the, the pandemic had, it posed a new risk that uh, uh, because risk tax is not, uh, is always uh, carries a, a bit of risk because people have been idle, airplanes have been idle, uh, the conditions in which uh, they, they, we put them back into operation is to be very, uh, you have to be very careful about that. And Flight Safety Foundation has uh, uh, put in place some uh, guidance for, to, for uh, operators to, to deal with that issue. In Africa, we have, uh, uh, I'm also privileged to coordinate a group called Af Aviation Safety Alliance for Africa where we discuss those issues. And uh, I, I will talk about that more if, if the questions, if you have time, but it's, a, it's, a, it's about bringing uh, safety concern to, to the grassroots level for all aviation professionals to, be, to, to, to have an opportunity to discuss uh, safety uh, activities and safety improvements. You are muted, Rafael. Now, um, fortunately, um, AFRA has always been very passionate about 
safety of African aviation. And every year, AFRA lines up a number of um, programs, either as an organization or in partner with other safety organizations on the continent to uh, build capacity and ensure that our airlines and aviation stakeholders meet the highest of safety standards. I recall that just last year, thanks to the African Development Bank's intervention to uh, support interventions to um, AFCAC towards the implementation of the single Afghan air transport market, AFRA and IATA have been the task to provide some initial training and capacity building for um, airlines are not yet IOSA or that are not IATA standard safety assessment level yet so that they can bring them up to that level. Now, this is a very good uh, initiative. Now, beyond this, what should AFRA or the other organizations on the continent such as AFCA be doing towards sustaining safety? Uh, thanks, Rafael, for reminding the uh, regional effort in which AFRA, IATA, AFCA, ACI participate and other organizations participate uh, strongly. And uh, it is, uh, safety is a continuous effort. It, you cannot say, okay, I'm, I'm safe and, and I can rely on my laurels. It's impossible. So we, it's a continuous effort. So awareness should be always uh, maintained uh, and also training, training, uh, continuous training, keeping the uh, pilots, the uh, maintenance team current in what they are, in what they do. And it's only about uh, the individual professional is systems. You, you, it's also a, a, a matter of creating the environment for, for people to work in a, in a stress less as, as much as possible to reduce the stress level in the industry for, for, to make to ensure that the system is safety conducive. Now, um, you, you said you lead another uh, safety-related organization on the continent. Can you tell us a bit about that organization and what you yeah, do? The organization is called uh, Aviation Safety Alliance for Africa. Uh, unlike AIG, it is, it's this time individuals coming together and think about how to bring, uh, how to complement the, the work that is already being done by, by institutions like AFRA, IATA, and others, and bring safety dialogue to the grassroots level. And, and so we engage directly with uh, the professionals through webinars, uh, training initiatives to talk about uh, safety. We are focusing this year uh, on runway safety, for instance, which is the highest risk on the, on, of safety on the continent and, and at the global stage. And, and for that, we, we, we have already conducted a, a webinar. We are preparing a second webinar very soon uh, to, to talk about the runway excursion and, and, we, and we continue like that. Mm. Now, now uh, tell me, African airlines, uh, some of which are on this, on, on listening to us now, are very keen on ensuring that post-COVID, the industry becomes more efficient, airlines operate more profitably and are able to make money. What should they begin to be doing now to prepare themselves towards that competitive future? The, the, the challenge for airlines is that the revenue streams and the cost uh, stream doesn't obey the same laws. 
So it's uh, difficult to, uh, if you don't, you can't adjust your cost to your revenue. Uh, on a short-term basis, it's okay, you can survive it. On a long-term basis, it's a, it's a risk, it's a problem. So the, the, in, the, in the current situation, I think the most urgent for the airlines is to rethink the strategy and review the system and be more, look at all areas of efficiency improvement. They, they can do so while the, uh, the, the demand is still not at the level where it should be. So the, the, the it is now that they can do that. When, when, the, when the industry recovers, it will be too late. They should also think in, in that, especially in Africa, in that area, I think it's, uh, it's an opportunity to think about the role of uh, cargo operation. We have seen the, the impact of, uh, during the COVID we have seen the, the increase of cargo operations. So that's an, a, new, a new avenue to adjust the, the, the model. And the, the way they, they are on the continent, the way they are organized, the mission on the continent uh, for me, aviation is about connectivity. And uh, the more, and the airlines are the engines of that connectivity. They are the ones who can develop that connectivity and build a new system called connectography, the geography of connectivity. Because you, thanks to the uh, aviation, you are no more bound to deal only with your neighbors. You can deal with anyone, any part of the world, like telecommunication, where you just pick your phone and you can communicate with everyone in the world. Uh, aviation is like that. You can build relationship with any country, anywhere in the world where you have interest. So you are not bound only by your geography. And for that, the airlines need to think about developing the connectivity on the continent. And they cannot do it alone. There is no airline on the continent who can build the connectivity that is required today for Africa. They have to come together. They have to build cooperation. And it's either uh, on the model of Ethiopian where you buy, you, you invest in other airlines, or maybe on the net, on the, uh, model that KQ, Kenya Airways and South African Airways are trying to develop. They say they will build a new Pan-African and by 2023. Let's hope they do so. And, and more, more, more airlines could join that group and form groups of airlines that will be more viable than individual airlines that we see today. So to, to actually realize the dream uh, or, or, or the, the realized speedily this initiative by KQ and SAA, what in your view should they be doing more of or less of? The two elements. So th those, uh, you, you know, th th this type of initiatives are made possible today thanks to SATA and uh, it's, it's in a liberalized, in a, is, a, is, a, is access to market that you can develop such initiatives. So uh, African aviation, African airlines should support the development of, of SATAM very, very, very more aggressively. It's, um, uh, it, we, we are moving the African way on, 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 on SATAM it's better than the Yamusuko decision itself, but still, uh, after two years or uh, 2019, when in the third year now, we are still only we only have 13 states that are fully SATAM ready, uh, and this should, we should be uh, more ahead of that. But nevertheless, let's start with the 13 countries that are 
Satam Reggie. And let's, let them work together, remove the, create the conditions for the, for the airlines in that system to, 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 uh, to operate and access, have it easy access to the market and, and start creating, uh, the, developing the system. So uh, let me refer to uh, the study that uh, Ayata uh, with uh, Af African Union and, uh, and, and World Bank has, has done, uh, simulating the certain implementation in the 55, 54 African countries and the impact that uh, will that have with the economy. So that's a, 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 an that should be an encouragement for the for the countries to speed up the implementation of SATA. Once SATA is uh, implemented, I, the, the 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 airlines should talk to themselves and see build affinities affinity groups. Uh, you see, KQ and SA have have started not because they are neighbors, but because they think they have they can do they can do it together. So. Uh, let, let them start talking to each other and build those, those grouping. Uh, I don't think that today we can only, we can have groupings of states like we had with, uh, with Air Africa in, uh, in the past, uh, because the mentality has changed, the priority has changed, but the spirit of coming together, uh, putting, putting the resources together, is still valid. And uh, I really encourage TQ and South African Airways to, to pursue in that direction. Do, would their governments, respective governments, have some role to play to edge them on or to of course. improve some regulatory environment? Of course, this cannot happen without government involvement. I, 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 uh, if, I, if I'm correct, it is, uh, in the back of the meeting between two governments that, that take you and SA uh, started, uh, started the, the partnership. So government, it, needs, it requires government support. It, uh, it, government has to facilitate uh, this type of uh, partnership. Someone was, was uh, I read from someone that what to expect from this kind of uh, partnership when the two partners are weak and, and loss-making uh, entities. But I believe that uh, a lot is, is to be achieved, uh, putting, pulling the resources together and uh, working in areas of uh, improving uh, the efficiency of the, of the system. And the governments have to to be part of it, not in terms of uh, uh, involvement, but facilitating, enabling that type of partnership. Oh, great. Now, uh, I also understand that when you talk about certain implementation generally across Africa, uh, you mentioned about the 13 that are fully compliant. Now, but I'm told that there seems to be some confusion here around who is going to implement certain. Is it airlines? Is it governments? Is it civil aviation authorities? Because I was talking to a CAA last week, and the impression I got was that, look, some of the markets are ready for, for, for access, but no airlines are making inroads. So what should we do? Like... Uh... It's like uh, chicken and eggs. Huh? Uh, yeah. First, the government have to create the opportunity by adhering to the certain uh, protocols. And then, uh, uh, so, so there is no more removing all the obstacles, but it, it is not enough. It only established the framework. It mm -hmm. is for the airlines and the industry to operate uh, the SATAM to, to make SATAM effectively ef efficient by, by uh, uh, operating. But you cannot also expect airlines to start operating when there is no trade 
when there is no free movement of people. And so these three initiatives have to come together. Satan, free movement of people, a free trade, and free trade cannot also uh, yield result without a, an harmonized uh, industry uh, policy. Uh, if you don't produce, what are you going to trade? And so, so all that, all those initiatives have to come together. I don't expect that uh, we don't, it's not only because Satan is implemented that we will see uh, uh, traffic uh, growing. All those initiatives have to come together. That is why it is very, very important that government and industry talk together and uh, have this implementation policy harmonized. Otherwise, it's like you build a, a highway and uh, you, you, nobody has uh, the, the resource to buy a car. So what do you do? So you have to, all that, all this initiative has to be thought through to get, uh, and, and come together in a timely manner. Wow, that is why a dialogue with the Africa Continental Free Trade Area is also critical here. So certain, certain implementation cannot be seen devoid of uh, the Africa Continental Free Trade Area. The two must necessarily work hand in hand. Africa. And that cannot work well unless the industry in Africa, the production center actually across borders are also working together. But again, then we come to the issue of the taxes, the harmonization of regulations, and the high cost of generally doing business in Africa. Exactly. This be harmonized. How can we have uh, African airlines, African businesses trading across border, people doing business across border, in a much more efficient way than we are doing now? Well, it, for me, it, it may seem um, uh, theoretic, but it starts with dialogue and understanding each other. It starts with uh, continuous advocacy. The, the governments, they put tax in place because they have, they think of budget, uh, tying up the budget. So they put taxes in place. Once the tax is there, uh, the impact on the consumer and the economy is not necessarily uh, well captured. So someone needs to, I remember we had a, we had a, a conference in um, Durban uh, where uh, Shaka Zulu Airport was uh, just newly open and, and the taxes to operate there went up 40% because of a, a government policy that is not, that didn't take into consideration the industry uh, capabilities. And at that conference, we realized that, uh, and luckily the government official that was there understood that yes, going forward, it's important that they talk before they, they, they make investment so that they know that the investment will benefit uh, so this like uh, uh, collaborative decision making uh, concept. Oh, okay. Now, now I I think at this point I time is uh, fast spent. So we now have twenty minutes to the end of our time. Let me let me switch a bit to um, the aviation African aviation industry group. And uh, before we come to our, our listeners and take some questions, I see. There are a number of questions that have already been lined up that I've just reviewed, and I see that most of them um, relate to AAIG. So we'll come to that in a bit later. Tell me, uh, why AAIG? Because we have Afra, Afka, Aza, Kanzo, and so on and so forth. Why AAIG? You remember, we realized that uh... There is a lot to do in Africa to develop aviation. And uh, it is not what, what, for each group, for each organization to do its own thing that will help us get there. So 
we had that discussion together and we started uh, talking to other organization. At that time, we were the VP of IATA, uh, Africa VP for IATA, and we started this conversation. We talked to AFRA, we talked to uh, ACI, we talked to Council, and they were, ESA, they were all, all excited about the initiative. That's where, that's how AIG came about. You took the leadership uh, from the onset. Uh, IATA offered uh, the IATA Forum for AIG to have its annual aeropolitical forum. And we started this way. Uh, I've been uh, lucky, privileged to take over you after a few years. And, and here we are today. So we all felt that it is important that we have a, a place where we can meet and uh, harmonize uh, strategies from various groups in order to uh, speak to governments and other stakeholders with one common voice. And the, the work that we do at AIG can inspire, can guide the work of each organization. You have, you have seen that AIG is not in the way of each organization. It's a place where we come together, organization comes together, they think strategies, they think what is, need, what is needed to improve aviation in Africa, and then each organization can uh, take that into its own uh, plan. And that's how we operate for now. Wow. So, so this is a very laudable uh, objective, and, and it's been very good, actually, to bring in people who are in the business side with the industry organizations, and then get them to dialogue, because we both interact with governments and with regulators and with decision makers across countries. So if we come together and we harmonize our ideas and views, then we all speak with the same voice and the same minds to our um, partners and business uh, associates so that they know that we are not speaking at cross purpose, but we are very much aligned. Uh, that is a very good thing. So what would you say have been the achievements of um, AIG to date? We have had, uh, uh, since uh, the inception, we have had uh, our annual aeropolitical forum where we have had, uh, we have produced uh, communiques and recommendation. And we are focused, and we are still at that stage because uh, as you can see, the work of AIG is a long-term one. You cannot expect things to happen overnight. Organizations are strong. You have IATA, which is a very strong organization. Uh, AFRA with its own, or, or each one has their own uh, approach. And it's, uh, it, is, it takes time for them to, be, to get, to start to talk together, to get to, to each other and, and build that synergy that we are aiming for. We are still at that stage where we are building the synergy within the organization. And I think uh, if you have had the opportunity to attend uh, our forum and webinar, uh, there are, uh, uh, there are, there are some, um, we are making progress in that direction where we, we, we talk, uh, we talk, we, we, it's not talkative uh, sessions, but we talk to we talk to understand each, what needs to be done, yes. and each one each organization then implement through their own plan of actions. I, 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 I want to mention one thing. Sorry, yes. uh, please go ahead. The that's that's uh, the it's the lab that uh, Afra is working uh, is putting together for for. Uh, for the AIG and the industry at large, that will bring uh, together and create the opportunity to really uh, get down to, to the point with SATAM, uh, AFCT, and all these initiatives that we talked earlier, how, what actively, what practically can we do to speed up the implementation of all those initiatives in a coordinated way? And I think I, I have a great hope for, uh, for this lab that, we, that uh, AFRA is uh, putting together and we'll, we, we'll, it will help us move faster to the goal of AIG. 
Yeah, you, in, indeed, I think the lab is something that the entire African aviation industry is looking up to for 2022. Um, thanks to AFRA, the lab promises to actually address directly some of the critical issues impacting African aviation today and into the future. And we hope that by bringing multiple stakeholders together from across the air transport, trade, tourism, and business together under one roof to deliberate on critical issues and arrive at consensus, we would all have a clearer way of how we implement certain Africa continental free trade area and by extension, how we ensure the sustainability of African aviation trade and tourism sectors going into the future. That's a, a very, very good one. Now, just, just tell me something again about AAIG. 2022 and beyond, apart from the lab, which I know you are preparing to actively participate in and, and help us fashion out the best of ideas going forward, what are the other things that we should be looking out to from AAIG 2022 and beyond? The affordability of air transport has been a concern, a common concern of all, all, all members of AIG, and we will continue having a, a dialogue on that and uh, looking for practical uh, solution. How do we make air transport affordable for Africa? In a, so that the 90% of Africans who are excluded today from the, from the air transport system can start uh, getting in. And, and so uh, this is a long-term also dialogue. We will have, we will continue this dialogue in, 2000, in 2022. The sustainability is also, is linked to the affordability. Uh, on one hand, we, the cost of transport is high, but the airlines, uh, the, the airlines, the airport need to uh, be sustained, uh, sustainable, uh, economically and financially sustainable. So there is a continuous effort of restructuring that, uh, that is required. Uh, so we will uh, we'll continue talking about that and find s solutions for airlines to be more efficient, for uh, the airports to be more efficient in uh, the, the whole aviation system to be more efficient. OEMs are participating to this dialogue, so the, the, we, we can see, uh, see how uh, a better utilization of the resources that they provide to the system can help making it more, uh, improving that uh, efficiency that, uh, that is required. Uh, and, and so this is mainly the, the, the focus that uh, we have for 2022. Excellent. Uh, uh, what a good note um, to pause and then take questions and comments that are coming from uh, our participants. And I thank you very much, all those who have submitted questions or comments already. We're asking for more that we have a number of them here, uh, starting from Adil Jalil. He says, there's a very low focus on feeder services to the main hubs in Africa. When we talk about government, they are looking to become large airlines. That is, when we're looking at government-owned airlines, they always want to be the big, mighty airlines. So the question is, what can AIG do? What role can you play in changing the outlook of government and the private investors to focus more on the regional intra-Africa groups feeding into main hubs? So thanks, uh, Adil, for, for this question. My view is that if we, if we look at uh, the whole continent, uh, I was talking about uh, groupings, airline groupings earlier. I focus on airlines because they are the engine of the transformation. They are the one who can drive the transformation. And 
if we have four to five groups of airlines, really the rest can play that feeding role that uh, is mentioned within the group. And I believe that everyone can win. There will be a win-win solution for everyone. It's not, it is impossible for the 54 countries to be like uh, Ethiopian or Emirates. Uh, it's impossible. So, uh, but for them to, to play the, the role uh, that they could play, the, the, the system needs to be in place. So I, I think uh, if we have four to five groups of airlines across the continent uh, where they can, part, they can be part of, then we can see that uh, uh, feeder role develop is easier, easily. Okay, thank, thank you so much. Uh, a follow-up question from Adil is, is that can AIG intervene with OEMs and MROs so that they can offer bigger discounts on the services or equipment they provide to African airlines so as to make travel affordable? So that's one of the ways. So, so first, first of all, can do? yeah, Adil, the OEMs are members of, uh, participate to AIG's activity and they, they, they are well aware of the uh, necessity or to make uh, air transport affordable uh, for in, in Africa. They, it is not in their interest to uh, keep the situation as it is today. Uh, you know, they are more, all of, all of, everyone has more to gain with a, a bigger, a, a, a grow, a, a bigger industry than what it is today. Africa has the potential, uh, you see, I just remember that it's 20% of land mass. It's uh, uh, 16, 17% of the world population, 75% of young people. And it's, yet it is 2% or 3% of the uh, traffic of, of, of the fleet of, so there's a, 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 that's a paradox that everyone is interested to, to address and OEMs included. So the, the, it is not in the, in the interest to, uh, to maintain high, uh, uh, high, high cost or, or so. If the, the dialogue exists within AIG and they, they contribute to that, and I, I don't think that it's only a matter of uh, giving discount. It's a, more com it's a more complex approach that needs to be taken and we are heading there. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, the next question is from Roger Aloti, a long time lost friend of mine. I'm happy to hear from you, Aloti. Now, he's saying the Yamosukro declaration and decision took a while before being approved by African governments as a decision. Now, shouldn't African airlines be considering a continental declaration, decision, and a solemn commitment following the Satam, which will encompass all the issues, including but not limited to safety and integration. In other words, why would we not be looking at a simpler one-off approval or endorsement by our states of all the issues that are impacting on the implementation of SATA, rather than looking at them piecemeal? Your comments on that? Well, um... This touches to the way uh, countries operate and the, the laws. You cannot uh, change the laws of operation of the 54 countries uh, of, of, overnight. They, they, they have, uh, each country has his approval process. Uh, when the government commit to uh, a, a declaration or a treaty, it has an approval process that needs to be, you need a domestication of, uh, 
of the decisions that are taken by government. So it, is, it will be difficult to have a system uh, that bypasses that and, and works effi efficiently. So I don't think that uh, as much as I, I, can, I can understand uh, the, the, conce the concept, I think it's difficult to, to be to put in place. It's not a problem for countries to approve the way they approve uh, SATAM or so. It's uh, the motivation. Are they, do they understand? Do they want it? Uh, do we all want it? Sometimes it is the industry also. The airlines who say, uh, I'm not ready for this, or, or uh, you shouldn't do that because of our national or specific condition. And uh, that's, that slows the process. It's not only the government. That is why the dialogue at the national level between government and the aviation industry at the regional level, at the global level is important. And in, and in, Af in Africa, we need to have that dialogue permanent. We, we have been talking about taxes and charges uh, for some time. We talk about it in fora. Do we talk about it uh, at the grassroots level, at the airport level, with the airport and the government and the, uh, the national airlines when it exists? Uh, what, what, how, do, how can they, we find a solution for that, for that problem? And, uh, we, what we talk about it at forums and and uh, uh, large uh, large groups, we have to to bring those dialogue to the grassroots level to make it efficient. Yeah. I think I think we we are running out of time now, but we still have about three questions uh, from Daniel Wanza. So we we just briefly would uh, touch on these ones. Um, the first one says almost all national flag carriers. Over they die over time. Are we looking at private carriers taking over the routes? This is the first question. But private sector doesn't need uh, uh, to be incentivized to, to to invest when they see the opportunity. Uh, this is the this this what this is what they are looking for. So uh, the involvement of private sector is as much as it is uh, uh, desirable. The conditions have to be created for private sector to come in. Today, the, the, the restrictions over the access to the market, the uh, challenge of running the, uh, running aviation, uh, uh, it's not a, a huge, it's not a profit making uh, industry. Uh, it's it's a service industry, and uh, it is not very attractive to to private sector. So government has to deliberately. Uh, make it easy for private sector to want to invest in the sector. Great. So in other ways, government needs to create the enabling environment. Exactly. Once the private sector sees opportunity, nobody will tell them to go in. They just exactly. jump. Yeah. Once the second question is, intra-Africa aviation networks have been limited. How do you envision the future of aviation in view of the Africa continental free trade area. With limited network, what we should talk, we do? We talked about it earlier. Uh, it, it's a, it's a multi, multi pieces puzzles that needs to come together. So uh, it's not one, 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 one action only. Uh, uh, we talk about uh, trade, we talk about industry to support trade, we talk we talked about energy to support in industry. There is no energy. You cannot have industry. You don't have industry. You cannot have trade, and you you, you cannot uh, and you may have, you may have a certain it will not yield the results. So all these pieces needs to be put to come together and build consciously, deliberately, uh, with, uh, with a plan. Uh, and and we are we don't have a, such a such a plan in place. We need to build that plan with taking into the, taking into consideration all the pieces that need to come together for it to happen. Thank you, thank you so much. And the final question from uh, Daniel. Uh, he says um, governments have been reluctant to invest in aviation. Uh, kindly confirm the political will. But Daniel, this one, let me just give you a straight answer. I think 
Yes, governments have been reluctant to invest in aviation. Of course, um, let's face it, how many um, of our citizens actually uh, use uh, the air transport? And we remember we are in a, po a competitive political era now under democracy. So for governments to win votes, they need to do certain things that are more tangible to majority of the population uh, rather than the intangible. So it can be understandable that governments are not as enthusiastic about aviation as before, but it is what it is. Airlines, once government creates the right environment, airlines should be able to fend for themselves. Government, uh, sorry, airlines are not asking for bailouts. They only want the right environment to be created. Now, and two more questions, one from Tillman and the one other one from Roland, and then we wrap up this. Tillman says, Saturn needs time and patience. Should we not concentrate on what is the 13 fully established and go on, many will follow in, in their lead. What do you think? I fully support that. Yeah. If we shouldn't yeah. stop. We shouldn't wait. We, should we shouldn't start. wait. Yeah. Get started. Yes. But, but Tillman, like I was saying, I said earlier on, the issue is who starts? When we say let's start, we mean who starts? Have these, have the airlines in these 13 countries try to expand their operations across borders and have been stopped? So is it the Civil Aviation Authority who should announce that, no, the market is now open, you can fly from A to B, or the airlines who should say, ah, now I hear these two countries are full, uh, 13 countries are fully certain compliant, let me launch new flights, let me increase my frequencies there. We need, we need to know who does this. And for me, the test is in airlines making the effort. And then when you are then refused entry into a fully compliant certain country and your country is fully compliant, then you can now go to the executing agency with your consent. Fortunately, we have an executing agency established under AFCAC. You go there with your consent and hopefully those consents will be addressed. That is what I think uh, on that one. Now, let me take the one from Roland. Roland says, dispute settlement mechanism is key to effective connectivity of Africa by African airlines. Why the delay in adopting this to kickstart SATA? Well, I'm not too sure whether my guest will have an answer to this, uh, but because this lies more with AFCAC and the, uh, the, the African Union. But I, I leave it to my guest to see if you have any knowledge of what is happening here. Well, it seems that uh, the dispute settlement uh, mechanism has been uh, adopted. Uh, as far as I know, maybe uh, I need to, add, to update my knowledge on that, but it seems that it has been adopted by, uh, by the, the, the countries. It's not, uh, and, and don't overestimate what Satam will do. Satam will create the environment, but Really, what is what will drive the changes is the economic, uh, the trade, and and the free movement of people, the, the knowledge uh, uh, that if I, I only travel with if I have something to do on the other side, it's not because there is an airline that I travel. I travel because I, there is business to do, there is family to visit, there is friend to visit, or there is trade to make. So we need. While we are opening SATA, we need to focus on creating the opportunities uh, for people to move, for goods to be moved, and and for the, and we need to think that throughout. And that's that. Until we do that, we will still we will believe that SATA is not efficient. The Amsuko decision is no, no, no. It's it it cannot work alone. It has to be part of a system, and that system needs to be built. Uh, th thank you so much. Uh, that system needs to be built indeed. Um, thank you. Um, Tillman, you are pointing to us again that um, Ethiopia is ready, the North African countries as well, and Nigeria is coming up. Uh, private and government support through PP PPPs is important. We thank you very much for drawing our attention to that. 
our time is up, but I cannot let my guests go as is usual on these programs without actually asking him to give us some final thoughts. key takeaways, at least three, two or three of them. Thank you. Well, um, thank you, Raphael, for giving me the opportunity of this uh, uh, interview. And if I want to leave uh, the audience with key key point, I would say the, it, it, the government have to uh, really think about creating an enabling environment for aviation to start because without aviation, they will not, they cannot reach the social and economic aspiration. So removing unnecessary taxes, effective implementation of SATA, AFCTA, free movement protocol are part of the solution. So that is the government. African airlines should aggressively embark on groupings. They cannot survive alone. I don't see the, the, the future for uh, an airline for two or three airplanes. So we need, they need to come together uh, in groupings. There are many models to choose from. And think about building connectivity across the continent. African DFIs should support these groupings and provide the financial restructuring solutions. As AIG, we will continue to provide the platform for airlines, airport, ANS, aircraft manufacturers and service providers to work together and harmonize the strategies for a better industry and government coordination. I, I am a strong believer and proponent of industry government working together at all levels, be it national, regional, and global. Thank you. Excellent, what a way to end. We need to work together. The DFIs must be up and doing with financial support and AIG will continue to be the engine that brings all stakeholders, all interested parties around the table to discuss and agree on a mutual way forward. Thank you very much, Mr. Shamshu, and for your time and uh, for being on the Sky Connect show today. And thank you all to my guests, especially those who have asked questions and made comments on the show. We really appreciate your participation and uh, we look forward to seeing you on our next um, uh, event, which is going scheduled to take place on the 2nd of March, 2022. We would in the next week be announcing our guest for, next, for the next show. Thank you very much all and you have a beautiful day. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye.